Hi guys, welcome back to the MHC podcast. Today we're going to be continuing our, our retrospective series. We're going to be looking at GeoGuardi by Boards of Canada. And today I'm joined by Liv. Hi, I'm Liv. Uh, we have both, we've both been planning this for a bit because even like ever since I started this series, I can't lie, I was kind of looking forward to talking about Boards, uh, boards of Canada. So um, this seems like a like an appropriate follow-up and continuation of the series. And uh, yeah, today we're going to be looking at uh, GeoGuddy, which is a great Boards of Canada album. More um, than great. It's more than great. It's it's better than it's better than all of them, even though Boards of Canada is all awesome. So. Well, they're all good, but this is like the yeah. most interesting one to talk about too. Yeah, for sure. There's the most, it's got like the most to unravel um okay so i guess to start off uh how i guess we should talk about how we got into boards of canada um so Liv, do you want to mention do you want to give yeah uh it's very strange because it's, it's kind of boring how i got into them <laughs> i was just sitting around one day four years ago and they came onto my spotify i don't i don't know how <laughs> Uh, then I was like, well, this sounds interesting. Uh, and I started listening to the albums. Yeah. And Giogatti, uh, I don't know. I read somewhere, but it was like this weird album that has satanic, uh, <laughs> afflictions and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember That's like why. which song you heard first from that Spotify? Uh, like what album uh, was it from? I think it was Aquarius actually. Okay, fair, fair, fair. Yeah, it's like pretty basic, but yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I got in. We were discussing this earlier, but I think I got into the into boards of Canada through like, um, or at least I discovered them through like music reviewers online, and then a f I, I noticed a few of them were, um, kind of ranking, Geogadi the highest amongst all their other albums so that was that was the, just the reason why i checked this one out first even though most people would say if you're going to try get into boards of canada you should start with like music has the right to children or campfire headphones yeah um, i actually started with that i mean if yeah. i would i would still say that i'd, I'd say you shouldn't start with geogadi obviously yeah but, it's, it's really uh, not accessible it's definitely the least accessible album. yeah because i remember when i um first heard it i did like enjoy it but i wasn't yeah I, I think it comes down to that like accessibility thing where i wasn't like replaying it over and over but once i was kind of decided to look at the rest of their discography and like give it a listen so like with music has the right to children i remember i think the first time i heard music has the right to children i was just doing homework in like year 13 or no not year 13 it was like probably year 12 um which is when I was like, when you're like 17, FYI. Um, and yeah, I was just, I put it on and then I just had it on repeat while doing homework, basically. It is big brain music. <laughs> it is actual big brain music. I mean, I don't know if, I don't know the, the formula or if there's any reason behind it, but it is good for working. Like, I feel like most of my yeah. listening to it is just by doing, while doing work. Which is so strange because so much is going on in, on like in these songs. You yeah, I know. Really I know. Greatly yeah, it is weird because like, I play it around my friends, or at least like if I played it around my friends, sometimes they're like, "Oh, this is making me like anxious, and I don't like it, and there's like too much going on and stuff." And it's 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 strange because while doing work, like I still kind of agree with that, but it doesn't it doesn't kind of distract me at all. Like I don't know how to explain. It's if anything, I'm more like within the work or at least I'm, I'm just yeah i'm just less distracted so uh some background behind the record uh i think this dropped it dropped in 2002 right it didn't really have much promotion or anything um behind it and i think they played it in if i recall correctly it was there were like listening parties within churches yeah in like uh i think six different cities including tokyo and berlin yeah. and it was just 
like these really strange listening parties and i remember reading about one account where this guy was like basically some people fell asleep and others just left <laughs> because it was either way too loud or just too strange yeah yeah i can imagine that actually that's actually when was the last live show they've done oh my god uh i think it was the warp anniversary thing that was like in 2000 uh 2000 actually i think okay two, wow. 2005 i have no idea i don't want to say anything wrong but yeah around that time yeah because i i it's actually hard to imagine like what even they would they would sound like live a few recordings of them live uh that's just one track spyro it's like really great cool yeah um i think like yeah what is it berlin like london edinburgh tokyo Somewhere in America, probably. Yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, the weird thing about the album is when it was released, there was no promotion at all. Like, no singles. Nothing. Yeah, like, unlike their previous stuff. Were, were they I mean, singles for... Like... Yeah, the only, the only thing they released previously was, like, music has a right to children, so... Yeah. It was anticipated, but they literally didn't say anything. Even the one interview they did, they told the guy, you can't release this until the album's out. Okay, right, interesting. And then in between Music as the Rights of Children and GeoGuddy, they, they still dropped that EP, didn't they? Uh, in a beautiful place out in the country? Yeah. Yeah, I think so, yeah. I guess they, they probably don't really promote much anyways, in general. But I with mean, GeoGuddy especially. Tomorrow's Harvest they promoted really heavily. Yeah, I can see can... that. Just because it's it's more like modern day, I guess. It's all, it's also more it's more mysterious too than Giogardi actually, which is strange. Yeah, tomorrow's harvest. Yeah, for sure. But yeah. Uh, oh oh, because they have this need to make a like wholly different album sound every time. Yeah, of course. I think uh, that's another thing that's interesting about them as artists and their discography is that within what see like i mean they're obviously lost media but stuff well, like i wouldn't what? call it that i wouldn't call it lost media because uh it would imply that they actually released something and it got lost but they never really release anything and the stuff that gets leaked is usually by people they trust it and then they just oh leave. Okay. And they, then they get really fucking mad, like genuinely. But they have this one like joking uh, reply that uh, this, these other musicians said that they have a few tapes from them. But if they were to release it, uh, the brothers would come over and break their legs. Fair enough, though. Like, if yeah, you're going to trust somebody it. enough, yeah. And I think that's like the whole thing about them the, the mystery, yeah. stuff like that. Even with the album sound, you, you never really know what what's coming next. Yeah. I mean, going, sure. going from Giogatti to, uh, what was it? Um, Campfire Headface is also just bizarre. Mm. Yeah, totally. It doesn't feel like, I mean, in some ways their progression feels logical, but also it's obviously it's hard to predict what would come next. Because to me, looking, because obviously I can look back at all their records and stuff. And when I look back on music as a right to children and then GeoGuddy, it feels like a logical step and like progression, even though they both sound completely different. Um, I think GeoGuddy kind of takes the sound. I think it sounds in the way it's produced more similar to music has the right to the children than it does to the campfire head phase and, um, Tomorrow's Harvest, for sure. But I think that's just more to do with the fact that it was kind of produced like around the same era. Yeah. But, and but I don't know. I feel like Music as a Right and then GeoGuddy kind of exist, like coexist more than the other albums. They feel like more related. Although, I mean, you could argue that GeoGuddy feels more related to Tomorrow's Harvest, but I don't know. Yeah, they're like, they're like day and night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're connected to each other. Poof. Probably because uh, a few of the recordings on Giogatti were probably from the time that they recorded Music as the Right to Children. That's yeah. the thing they do. They, they like record a batch of like 400 tracks because 
uh, from an interview, they said they work 15 hours in the studio. So uh, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so I just have these tracks lying around and just kind of seeing how they uh, let every track intact with each other and if that one fits into the theme or not. It's really interesting because it's not like conventional album making or you're just like I'm gonna record an album yeah yeah I I don't know that was something that really like surprised me when you first told me that because it surprised me but also it's it's also not that shocking just because when you do listen to that stuff it's or at least that albums I guess there's there is a, a obvious theme within within the record but like it all feels kind of disjointed still like there's just a lot of different random tracks um so yeah but obviously i think it does really um it the imperfections do help help the album and like it feels like it flows better um and that's of course what sets boards of canada apart from so many other like artists within i guess if you want to you know i if you would just for the sake of simplicity just call it idm like boards of canada do approach it differently in the sense that it is more about deliberately like cause creating imperfections and i mean you know they've they've been quoted to the, they've said themselves that they do this on purpose yeah i mean when you listen to like apex twin i think that's what i also said it's not it's i mean apex twin is great but yeah. you, compared to boards of canada it's like really clean cut and you're not going to hear any uh, demonic samples. I mean, not literally, but yeah, in the process of like um, something that just sounds odd or atonal. Yeah, Whereas for sure. If you listen to Giagati, I mean, just like the first three tracks, you're like, what is going on? Yeah, literally. Yeah. They're both um, very different artists, of course, but like even just. I even just within like techno music and like IDM and stuff like I just haven't heard anything like Boards of Canada um still um yeah I mean there are a lot of artists that clearly blatantly did try like uh Casino vs Japan I think yeah yeah with like yeah. the with, like the children voices samples and stuff like that yeah uh, I mean it's good but it's 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 like scratching the surface it's not even close because um there are so many layers in a both like in one song uh it's, it's not just drums uh i don't know some synth and that's it it's it's definitely 50 layers and every time you listen to the song you hear something new which is not very easy to do yeah because usually sure. songs are meant to just be straightforward yeah totally i feel like then again i think there is a sim like sort of like simplicity within a lot of their songs like or at least w within some of their songs that i enjoy like quite a lot so like you know si happy cycling um yeah. that's one of my favorite board songs just because it's it's kind of built up of like repetition i've watched a video of, of it where somebody did a track breakdown and it was like it was just i guess it made me see their music in, it, in a different way or at least appreciate it more just considering just in terms of the fact that like there's they know exactly like they're very patient with what they're putting into their music as well and like they know how to like kind of I don't know they just know how to introduce things and not make like make sure the listeners not bored throughout even though even with very simple song structures like in Happy Cycling um and I feel like, yeah, that song "Happy Cycling" is like a really good example of that. Yeah, but they they produce like the way of um, producing songs is very unique, I think. But also like "Happy Cycling," uh, the way it's built up, it, it reminds me of like, uh, uh, what's it called, "Bolero" by Ravel, Maurice Ravel. You know, with, with the drums, like this very simple. I don't uh, know. I th I think. You don't, you don't know that. Well, it's it, it's like an uh, orchestral piece, and okay. it's just it just that's very simple, and then it builds up to this, uh, with like more instruments coming in, but it's just like the same uh, rhythm still. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But also, and, 
yeah when when i watched the breakdown it was i think it shows just like how they are masters of the synth like i know it you can't just sum up a boards of canada song with just like like you said just like a drum loop and some synths but yeah there's a very clear like i think there's this um obviously there's an idea within synths where it, it kind of especially within boards of canada's music it kind of like one synth will tell an entire story or like kind of an emotional story i guess it's hard it's hard to explain but like it's there were some synths in happy cycling where it kind of if i if you were to describe how that sounds on an emotion emotional level it sounds maybe starting off as kind of uneasy and kind of like anxious feeling and then it will kind of resolve itself like i'm talking about the metal the melodies here they kind of resolve themselves and then they sound like oh everything's okay everything's fine now and that's kind of like what i get from um happy cycling and uh in a weird way where it's like it's obviously a bonus track that was added to the album later after after um recording music has a right to children i think um and i feel like it's a really i think thematically and like when you even when you just look back into how they were bridging over to geo gaddy it kind of it feels like almost there's that those anxieties that come out of like geo gaddy and they're kind of like introducing that within happy cycle yeah i think i get what you mean but uh but i think it's such a sense also the snaz like specifically the snaz they they have a have an odd way of masking them like sorting them to to the point where you don't even know it's a snare and they look really well with that too but with happy cycling um another, another interesting fact is happy cycling uh, it came out later because it was released on Cycling Day. You know, the day okay. L- LS, LS, LSD was um, yeah, 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 yeah. first actually used by somebody. Uh, so it's also very very much on theme. Oh, shit. Know. That makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, also, of course, the, the, the track kind of sounds like like wheels okay. turning on a bike. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is, they, they're also really good at just like stereo mixing. And they know how to move around the sound, and it, it, it doesn't sound like unnecessary. <laughs> it's actually very necessary. And I think that the whole being on theme also plays into Giogatti because that album is uh, very, like, uh, the, even the length, like, it's, it's uh, 666 minutes. Yeah. Or something. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. It's not minutes, but. Uh, yeah. 66 minutes and six seconds yeah exactly yeah. and uh that wasn't even the idea it was it was the owner of warp records who was like you know if, if you could just make it at length with the whole silence on um the mm. last track because the last track of um Giugatti is completely silent yeah i mean that that's a, that's a japan release so there's another song that that's like a bonus track but the actual last song uh is completely silent so they kind of made it they took the chance and made it that long yeah yeah i didn't know that it was just a like somebody from warp that brought it up to them <laughs> yeah. it, it does, it really does funny. make sense though because the whole album does feel like kind of yeah. kind of satanic i guess they, they, they were in, a, in that headspace if there was an interview i said um but during that time they were like really interested in cults not mm. because they're cultists they're not satanists they're not anything we're just kind of living their life you know but people yeah. have to interpret really evil shit into it which is so unnecessary because um that's not their intention and then people just listen to their music uh for the wacky demonic sounds like that's not that's not what, what they want mm. and it's also just wrong because you're just completely disregarding a whole song to say funny uh sample demonic haha yeah it's some, for sure. it's, satanic panic 80s thing it's just unnecessary i don't know yeah i think that's interesting that you bring that up as well because um with geo Gaddy, that was kind of the impression i got of it before listening to it and and 
even when listening to it for the first time, it was like, or, you know, when I show it to people, like I showed it to one of my friends and I was like, oh, this is like music has a right to children, but it's a bit more like demonic, basically. Um, which I guess it is, I guess it kind of does sound like that, but yeah, it's not really like the focus of the record. And like, it's not what, it's not what is kind of the main driver for it being my favorite um, Boards of Canada album anyways. I, the, the reason why it's kind of probably my favorite, I think it's just the most consistent. And as well as that, I think it's probably their most ambitious record out of all of them, like quite easily. Um, it's also very, um, of course, it was like inspired a lot by, like like you said, by their just interest in like cult, cultists and stuff. Yeah, especially um, the Davidian branch. Had, yeah, like, this whole shooting out in Texas. They're really fascinated by that. Yeah, I think isn't that um there's that line in 1969, right? Yeah, yeah, 1969 in the sunshine, and that's that's actually from um uh, a video from that cult where they said that. Oh damn! Okay, yeah, that's like I think that's one of my favorite tracks on GeoGuardi for sure. But there are a lot of themes. It's it's it's, it's not just uh, that fascination of cults, but also preserving nature and all that. That's, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. That's, it was... that's, that's a huge point, I think. Especially, yeah. it's, it's it's right in the middle of the album. Uh, I actually tried to, like, structure it because there really is a structure, weirdly enough. Like, mm. the beginning is very, like, an overture, like an introduction. And then it just goes into uh, the actual theme of, like, Julian Candy is about uh, literal murder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's no. That's literally exactly what I was gonna say. Um, that, like, with obviously GeoGuardi being one of my favorite, uh, well, my favorite Boards of Canada record is that it feels the most inspired by nature more so than their other works. Like, I know Boards of Canada generally are, you know, described to be like kind of inspired by nature and their surroundings and just the environment, but I think there's some element of GeoGuardi that kind of feels. Almost like, I mean, even just in the name Geogotti, you know, what is, in fact, what does Geogotti even mean? It's, they don't really explain it, but Geo means like off, and yeah. what Gotti means, like, there are 10 different possibilities what it could mean. But yeah. I, I think it's just, uh, it actually plays just on, on this theme of uh, nature and how humans interact with it. Yeah, I don't sure. know. It it sounds strange, but when you actually listen to um, like from 1969, what you're talking about right now, uh, which which flows into energy warning, and it's just literally a sample from from some PSA from the 70s or something about a kid saying, "Hey, in the future, you're not gonna have any oil or whatever, and the earth's gonna be in ruins. So do something now." And it mm. just then it just flows into beach at red point. Yeah, you know, and it's I just think... this idyllic um yeah yeah and i think that's another um point of discussion is how this album is structured basically with one it's like one more like full track and then interludes after each one which is different from like i guess music has the right to children sort of has this but it's a bit in my opinion it's a bit less consistent and it's the track placements feel a bit weirder personally like, I feel like some points in music has the right to children, like, kind of those tracks leading up to Roy Biv. I don't know how to pronounce what that anyways, but um, it kind of, there's almost like too many interludes, but the structure here in GeoGuddy, where it's like track, then interlude, then track, then interlude. I feel like it kind of like, yeah, yeah. Help, it helps bring it all together a, a lot better and also kind of introduces a more clear narrative to it even or at least clear, as clear as you can get with something like GeoGuardi anyways um yeah, yeah i like to think that like the first three songs are like in their own universe hmm. and gyroscope and um to like the smallest weird number uh i also like uh, another part mm -hmm. and like track uh 10 which is anti-69 to i don't know 12 which is beat at red point like about nature i don't know it, it, it has a clear thing and every song at, at the beginning of those parts is like a an introduction basically yeah for sure but, but they really are i mean they're like 30 seconds long <laughs> oh. yeah 
literally. I kind of see what you mean, how it feels like. I mean, of course, it's all open to interpretation. I think yeah. that, that, well, that's what They leave it open favorite. to interpretation. So Yeah, for sure. Um, and I've heard so many people say different things about uh, their music and also this album specifically. But like, yeah, even if you think about Dawn Chorus leading into like Diving Station, like Diving Station is like really like miserable of a track. I don't know how to explain it. Um, usually I don't always listen to GeoGuardi as a whole album so I know some songs better than others like so I basically what I'm saying is I less so like revisit the interludes but the place something like the placement of Diving Station after Dawn Chorus feels very deliberate even though we've kind of already discussed that they do sort of have a bunch of tracks and they pick or like whittle down a track list into an album basically. Um, Interesting that you say that because uh I, don't, I have this interview open where um, Mike, which is one of the... I, I don't think we interviewed the members, but hey, it doesn't matter. Uh, he basically says that Diving Station is a song that he wanted to like express something bittersweet. That is that is like the ominous and that the contrasts uh, the the other tracks. So, yeah. the observation makes sense, yeah. That's interesting, yeah. I think another way, this is just even by kind of explaining it off of a different way of interpreting the album, which is kind of like, it kind of feels like a bit of an acid trip, like how it feels. Definitely, yeah. It feel, it doesn't feel like, it's not supposed to make you feel comfortable. Like it's not, it's, I don't think it's kind of rooted in the same senses of, senses of like nostalgia as like music has the right to children kind of expresses through its sound and stuff. Um, I think it's I think it comes from like the same place because again like boards of Canada kind of have that just within like their synth work and stuff they've they kind of are always going for that sort of like aesthetic anyways but I think in GeoGuddy it's not its purpose isn't really to do what they were doing on like music has the right to children or like make the listener feel comfortable throughout yeah that reminds me of the first time I listened to it, I was just, I don't know, I was having a bad time, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> because it was dark outside, it was basically midnight. And then you listen to an album like this, completely alone, it's it's, it's actually kind of trippy. I don't know. Like, I, 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 I clearly remember that moment because I felt so scared in a way. <laughs> But I love it. Like, and, and then after all these like terrifying tracks, Dawn Chorus came on, and I was in heaven. Like, I it yeah. was a song where I, I literally cried. I'm not even joking. The first time mm. I heard Dawn Chorus, I, I had tears in my eyes. Dawn, Dawn Chorus is like one of the yeah. best, but best definitely for sure. Yeah, no, it's like that's and and that's the funny thing. It's just like going back to this track list in in like this track list compared to the other track lists in the other albums. I think just this one makes the most sense like narratively and like sequent like how they've sequenced it and and every time as well it's not you could kind of interpret it a lot differently as well i don't know it's yeah. just very like audio vision it's very audio audio visual of an album yeah it brings out like a lot of um it's it's easy to get your imagination going like i guess when you're listening to it it's, it's it's especially like the album cover and the titles. It just feels ominously warm, but not like yeah. not, not 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 a good summer night. Like a like a modern thirty degrees outside and you're dying and melting kind of feeling. Yeah, literally. And I feel like going back to how like this album feels kind of trippy and and almost just feels like a like an acid trip or something. It it kind of it does resonate because of how like. I guess not messy the track list is, but it just feels like you're in one place and then you're in the next place. And, and it's like, you're kind of, it's like, it's yeah, it's like waking up in into a different vibe or like a different mood in a different, like within the next track, if that makes sense. Like, yeah, I wouldn't even say next track. It's like, like every three songs or four songs, yeah. you're basically in a different uh, room. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's like going back to like, how I was saying, you know, there's sometimes within every synth, there's so much thought behind like a melody, like within within every synth melody, there's usually like 
an emotional story they're telling you within just one synth like I, how i mentioned with like happy typing and i feel like that carries kind of that kind of idea you can apply that to this whole album in the sense that there are parts of it where which feel more like hopeful and then some parts of it that feel like more i guess yeah like hopeless obviously but, but i think that the, the yeah. place into the whole theme of uh childhood mm. uh I, I i read a few interviews with them where they basically said the reason why they use uh a lot of children's voices which is like a another uh thing they're known for which is i don't know it kind of annoys me if people know them as the bad the group that uses children's voices but yeah it, it's it's basically they describe it as like uh the years that you spend as a child are way shorter than you spend as an adult. You mm. know? Like you, 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 you're a child for like 10 years and then you're a teenager and then for the rest of your life, you're an adult. So that, that, that whole part, like your innocence and stuff like that uh, is, is very short and kind of gets lost in a span of, I don't know, like seconds essentially in the, if you look at it. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, a, and it's, I feel like that's, again, a lot of people bring it up, but that's one of the main drivers of, I think, why they even make music. I think it's just to reconnect with their childhood selves, childhood selves, I guess. Because, I mean, I think that's what, the, I mean, that's what I get out of their music sometimes. Like, even with Happy Cycling, um, I know I keep bringing the track up, but I just feel like it's like an, a quintessential Boys of Canada song. Um, like, that to me feels like within the narrative of like, or at least my perceived narrative of their discography, that to me feels like, okay, music is, has the right to children is like, I picture it as, as like you're happy as a kid and you're like going to the beach and stuff. And then happy cycling is like, you get lost from your parents and like, you don't know where you're going. And like, when you're a kid, obviously everything you're feeling is so amplified. And I think that's another aspect of their music where, of course, it's like they have a, put a large emph emphasis on kind of emotional storytelling within their music. It goes, in, it goes even deeper than that, I think, because, you know, as a child, there are a lot of things going on around you that you don't really understand until a few years later where you're like, oh, my God. Uh, and I think it's the same thing with the way they sample because, you know, you, if you first listen to the album, you don't really hear most of the stuff that's hidden and then you listen to it again a few times and you realize like all of these things were there the whole time so it's like the same feeling that you have as a child replicated i don't know i always loved that when when i first got into them I, it, was, it was just this really great experience like re-experiencing re, re innocence <laughs> i don't know yeah for sure yeah it's just it's, it's it's I think it's something just very specific though for me with like music has the right, right to children and Geo Gotti where like we've mentioned before it's kind of like night and day and like I just think Geo Gotti especially like just if you were gonna listen if you just listen to these two albums back to back it's very easy to picture like a narrative or at least interpret a lot of both of these albums kind of as one kind of whole piece i guess i feel like I, it's brought up a lot but a, a common interpretation at least that i've seen is that geo Gotti is kind of like after it works in kind of contrast to music has the right because it's like growing up and coming to terms with things and like is that kind of process like some people look at their discography as like literal like the journey of like child then adolescence then like I don't know. Like I don't know if that resonates with you, but I can see. No, I can definitely no, I, see that. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I get at that, especially um, if you ignore a uh, campfire head face and you just go straight into uh, tomorrow's harvest. It does make sense because the bleakest album is tomorrow's harvest. Like mm. G G Gotti is uh, actually quite happy compared to that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. This is, this is like a process. Like music has the right to children is is pretty, um, pretty happy. Yeah. You listen to it, you're in a good mood. Giugatti is a bit more ominous. You know, you listen to it. Uh, depending on how you feel, you're gonna feel differently about it. 
you know mm. if you're having a bad day it's gonna feel very um ominous mysterious kind of dark but you know if you feel good it's kind of i don't know it's it's just something different like yeah entirely. but tomorrow's harvest is like straightforward just bleak there's no future <laughs> and honestly and that's so interesting how like just even you know discussing this is why discussing like that music is so interesting to me is because you always think of ways to interpret it um yeah like with if you go by that like idea where it's like music if you just ignore campfire F head phase of course like where it's like those three albums tomorrow's harvest feels like just even production wise it feels like the most clear and you know exactly what's going on like but i don't know i think like if you take it so it's like child and adolescence then adult um i think that also I, another thing i thought of with geogadi is that yeah i feel like it is kind of like adolescence i think it is similar to music has the right to children in terms of the fact that it it's also a very short part of your life and it and it feels like kind of a hazy memory but i think adolescence is like of course in ways your emotions are also still kind of out of control and you know you're kind of starting to like come get to grips with like the realities of life and stuff and yeah, it's not it's you're just... not you're, you're very clearly not a child anymore i don't i don't know i feel like that does actually make sense in terms of like that idea with like the aging thing and like you are still trying to find yourself and stuff like that yeah there's just so much to talk about in terms of like just not just GeoGuardi, but even like kind of the narrative of their discography as a whole. I mean, <laughs> with the narrative, uh, I think we talked about, they, they themselves say like, they have a schizophrenic approach. They basically don't know themselves. I mean, they definitely know what they're doing, but they record so many things at once and so many projects at once that they probably have more unreleased albums than released ones. I mean, that's a fact. Mm. I mean, if they wanted to, they could probably release 10 albums right now but they won't do that because uh it, it's just not that thing to do maybe it's like an apex swing a apex twin thing to do you know but i think they're just too reserved too removed from this whole um fan service kind of thing they, they, they don't really make music for others i mean they do in a way but they prioritize like their own creative flow i think which yeah, is why they, I can see which, that, yeah. Which is why they don't release something, like, consistently. Uh, they, ha they haven't released something since uh, Tomorrow's Harvest, which was, like, in 2013. It's, I think could. it's, like, very, like, non-industry, like, anti-industry. Like, yeah. Like, no, like, I mean, you, there are tons of artists kind of still do that and nowadays and stuff, and it's not, like, a crazy thing. But, like, I think what makes Borza Canada different in, in that sense is, like, it does all kind of feel like it's, it's it does all just generally feel like they're just sharing what they've kind of put a lot of their like passion into and stuff it's obviously like they're clearly doing it when they feel like it and when they feel like it's necessary and like you said being reserved being re more reserved and like selective with what they're releasing and stuff yeah, and, and they definitely let, let their music speak for them they don't really you know go out and say hello this is us Mike and Mark is and that we are we, we, we like this and this and our hobbies are this and that and you know, they don't do that and the old like you can tell because the only recording of their voice was on a John Peel interview uh, in like nineteen ninety eight or something. And it was like one minute. Telephone was someone very remote. Is this true? Yeah, that's just about correct, actually. Well, I'm not going to ask you where it is because obviously you don't want people coming there and spoiling it all for yeah. you. Yeah, no, I, th I think I think it's probably been exaggerated a little bit, but I think um, as as far from technology as we can get is about as as good as we can get as far as we're concerned. Yeah, well, that does make. And what is your favourite letter of the alphabet? M. Is it? Yes, yeah. I, I always liked M. So, right, what are you what are you, you going to play for us now then? You know, they don't really yeah. they don't put themselves forward or like fast. They don't really do that they only speak when they uh, uh, are working on the project or just released something and yeah and not a lot of artists do that nowadays you know but the, the, uh, they're mostly like persons personality cults around these musicians yeah which totally. is yeah. which is which is really sad because um you know 
you should do music because you want your music speak for you and not because you want to speak for your music. Mm, for sure, but, yeah. But, yeah. But that's this interesting point that like uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be a weird comparison, but that's like this very independent bookstore in my, in my city, and the guy got like asked, why don't you put these um conventional books into your bookstore? You know, like like uh, romance stories from TikTok or whatever. You know what I mean? Mm. And he said, well, if if those big bookstores, like you know, the commercial ones, didn't exist then I couldn't exist. And that's kind of the same way with Boards of Canada. Like, like, they can only exist because these these kinds of artists that make it all about themselves exist, you know? Yeah. Totally. I don't know if that makes sense. No, that because, makes so much sense, yeah. Honestly. Because um, there's a market for everything, but if, if, if um, independent artists couldn't do their own thing because uh, big artists that uh, pollute the airways didn't exist, you know? Then they kind of have to be commercial. Mm, yeah, for sure. I don't. It makes sense to me. I don't know. No, that no, that does make sense though. But like, you can't really say much about them. You can really just say something about mm, the music. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and that and yeah, that's the that's the the difference that I'm talking about. Where it's like, but like they do that to. I think what I think what I was trying to say is that they do that to like an extreme degree. Like other artists do that as well. But like Boards of Canada, like there's barely anything that you can find on them. So yeah, people didn't even know that they were brothers until they <laughs> accidentally let it slip out in an interview, and they're like, well, didn't want to get compared to Orbital, which is so funny. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, yeah. How did they even start like making music? Does anybody know? Uh, yeah, I think they started when they were like children, ten. They had like these these multi-track recorders which I recorded, like, music on back and forth until it was completely disordered. Yeah. So, they, they, so they started pretty early at, like, 10 or something. Yeah, they've got to have, they have to have, like, some massive catalogue of, like, unreleased stuff. Yeah, which is so unfortunate. But, yeah. hey, at least we have Gio Gatti. <laughs> yeah, at least we have Gio Gatti. At least we have... I mean, the body of work they have, they've, they've got out is still, like, very solid. I mean, there's still so much... Like you said, I think... I think that's what also helps it age a lot better and like almost gives them an excuse to not have to release anything more is that it's just so like, you know, every time I go back to GeoGuardi or even any other like record or like mixtape or whatever, or like, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's, it's always, I always find like replayability in everything they've, they've dropped really. Um, especially like with GeoGuardi as well like that's something that's unique I find unique about GeoGuardi is that almost like not every month there's no really like specific time frame but I usually like change my mind a lot on the track list and then I start like liking some tracks more than others so like I mentioned before like I used to I, I 1969 is still one of my favorite tracks from the album but like before it was the favorite one but actually right now, like one of my favorite ones is um, You Could Fill the Sky, which initially I thought that was like one of the more weirder sounding ones on it. But like, I don't know. I just think I got like something out else out of it when I revisited the album as a whole and then listened to it. And I was like, I, it kind of gives me like weird, like nature documentary vibes. Oh, yeah. I don't know. It makes it makes me pictures like you know those time those time lapses of like mushrooms growing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. That's that's what the song is to me. It's like a time lapse of a mushroom growing, which sounds so stupid, but like that's interesting. That's like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I don't know. It's 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 weird. That's that's the weird thing about, or at least like I don't know. I think that's the cool thing about their music is like every I, we've already mentioned this so many times, but it's just so open to interpretation. I think it's like some of the most audio visuals music i've ever heard uh, but it made you think of nature yeah i think it's very like and yeah i think it's of course i like, open to ter interpretation but it's obviously they're doing something right considering that most people like usually are like interpreting it as kind of to do with nature and nostalgia and childhood and like all these things that people bring up is like seems to be somewhat consistent when we do a breakdown we could like talk about uh, uh, what 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 each song evokes, 
you know? Mm. Do you want to do a breakdown now? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I feel like we're going to have, we have so much shit that I'm going to have to edit. It's going to be crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but there's like a lot that we've talked about, I guess. But I think I've, I've waffled on them for a bit, quite a lot. So, a lot. so I'll probably just like edit stuff out. It's all right. Yeah. Um, like I literally am finding myself, self like sorry i haven't gotten like that much sleep before this recording because i've just been working loads but like i find myself like with boards of canada it's so much different to any other artist where i don't actually know like how to because everything that we're talking about like it's all based off like mainly interpretation so you yeah have to think about exactly how you're going to put that into words whereas like with another artist where it is is the case where you know, you've done the research and you know what they've said about the album and they're telling you what happened and the whole context behind everything and the history. And it, it's just like much more, it's way more simple of a process, process, I guess. I think um, it's like just better, you know, when you don't yeah. know anything. So you have to interpret totally. it. Yeah, no. And, and that's like, that's the most rewarding thing is like having these creative. conversations. And yeah, for sure. And it, it's like so fun to like kind of brainstorm and like think about these things as well because i always like think of something new when i'm talking about their music um, yeah same anyways uh so yeah track tra track by track breakdown i guess let's just get into it um uh ready let's go um of course that's kind of like a similar sort of style intro to an album kind of like wildlife analysis on music has the right to children um where it's like, it doesn't occupy that much space, but it kind of just gets you, it, it's kind of just like an interlude into the album, really. Yeah, I always say like, every Boards of Canada album has an interlude. Like, it always mm. starts with an interlude. To like, yeah. introduce the theme or something like that. And I think Ready, Let's Go is like, I think one of the best ones. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the title. I It's just so short, like, Ready, Let's Go. Yeah. And um, it starts with just like, uh, I think it's a synth, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It just gets louder and all these bleep bloop sounds come in. Mm. I don't know. It's, uh, but it doesn't really reveal everything. Yeah. I think, yeah, it's, it's, that is true, actually. It really and, does. And, and I, I like to like, imagine a car driving into the sunset. And I listen yeah, to same. It. Like it's if so... I were to compare this to wildlife analysis, like when I really compare the synth, kind of the synths as well, like wildlife analysis kind of feels like, and a lot of music has the right to children. Also, I mean, you know, it's called music has the right to children for a reason. But um, like all the synths feel much more like childlike and playful, I guess. But like the synth here just feels more. I don't know. It's just very different to like. I'm only comparing it to wildlife analysis because obviously it's like a similar way to open the album. But yeah, um, yeah. It just feels like very different to that. Like not any anything like wildlife analysis. I guess. Like wildlife analysis feels like more wholesome. It's um, like the same song but mirrored. You know. Yeah. Exactly. Like night and day. Like we said. Um, but yeah. Um, I guess there's another point where. It, I think I've read up on, I don't know if uh, you probably know this as well, but it's called Ready, Let's Go, but it's spelled without the apostrophe. Yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Is, it, is this is it like any anything deeper than just yeah. laziness? Yeah, literally. Like you could go, you could, yeah, talk about how, that as much as you want, really. It just depends. Um, I feel like they must I mean, just be trolling at that point, right? Like <laughs> People looking into things way too fucking deep. Yeah, I mean, this interpretation that I'm reading here is that some somebody says it's kind of because of the idea of letting go that they've yeah. included it. No, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a reach. Yeah, I think I it's know. a reach. Maybe I just wanted to save on ink, you know? Yeah, exactly. Right, anyways, so next track we have Music is Math. And yeah. my, opinion, my opinion on this one is kind of like, yeah, it seems like a like suitable way to like, like kind of like actual song it seems like a appropriate song to like start off with um just because it it's i know you said you have this kind of way of seeing the track list where it's like three songs and then it feels like you're in a different room and kind of something like that um or it's a can, kind of a different vibe i guess but like music is math to me seems if i 
had to like give a track to somebody off GeoGuardian, I'd probably just give music his mouth because it just seems the most like quintessential. And really? I, I feel like yeah, I feel like it's one of the more simple ones on it. Actually, I don't. I, I think it's like the most basic. One. Yeah, it, it exactly. Doesn't mean it's bad. It's just like I don't know. It's, it's That's not really what I mean. Yeah, I think it's, it's like the most. But the title is because uh, they talk a lot about maps in their interviews. I don't know. Why. I mean, I know why, but they're like really obsessed with it. Um, and I think music is math. You know, they they say math is like tears the curtain from reality. You know, that's what they mm. said. No, and I don't know. Saying music is math. Maybe I don't want to. I don't want to overanalyze. I mean, I mean, like music reveals more about your emotions or something. You know. Mm. Yeah, for sure. As in, like the same vein as maths. Yeah, yeah, I get that actually, and also like, of course, we're gonna be like, the reach the whole podcast is gonna be about reaching like, cause <laughs> yeah, out. like we literally have nothing to go off of, like pretty much. Um, I, I think that's what I want, you know. Yeah, like, exactly. Just just interpret your own thing into it. Who, it, it, yeah. It's fun as well, so whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like it, yeah, music is math is definitely like the most basic sounding song on the album which in an album of songs that are not basic at all so it's not like it's a basic song yeah it's name. still uh, um, great yeah okay um, i like how it kind of fades out at the end though as well it's like kind of very ominous i've heard the album like four thousand times but i always forget some songs which is so strange <laughs> because i've heard it so many times i know because yeah but that's because to me it's because it all, all kind of like bleeds in together as like one like, one lesson okay i, I actually um, really listened to the ending of music is math and i and i i forgot how beautiful it is <laughs> yeah it's so cool i don't know it's like yeah. this uh doppler effect voice i don't know like a yeah. siren Uh, the next track is the meme. Where the friend friendly stranger. Yeah. Why is it a meme? Because it's um, it's like the theme music and salad fingers, which is the YouTube cartoon thing. Okay. Like really scary vibes. Oh my god. Yeah. I I never really. I don't know. I think it's cool that uh, it's used in a very popular um youtube relic cartoon thing but that's what i mean with people that only know it from uh that usually are usually the types of people to go and say funny ominous satanic sample i don't know yeah but but the song is 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 is, is really disgusting if you really think about it i know what you mean yeah totally it, it sounds like this this uh, splashing sound. I don't know how to describe it, which is so eerie. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm listening to it now, and I can hear that for sure. And also has, has this like old, old time uh, white noise in it. You know? Yeah. Do you know what? As well, I think that's a, another like point to bring up with like just generally about the tracklist and like the production with this album, is like I was talking about. You could feel the sky, which is like the track that I revisit a bit more n nowadays, and. Like the sound, like I guess I don't know if you want to call it. I don't wouldn't call it sound design, but like I don't know. It's it sounds like kind of disgusting sometimes, like shit it's, on the album. Like it sounds like very like physical and in the real world. Yeah, it it it, it like collapses on itself. You could feel sky like the drums. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's it found sounds like kind of like hyper real. I don't know if that makes sense, but like the only reason why I said sound design, if it, even if it's not really the techni technically like the correct. Wait. Yeah, and another funny thing is, when when at least when I listen to the song, I I, I imagine these like liminal space uh, mm. rectangular things uh, moving. Yeah. It's just, it, 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 it it doesn't really. I don't know. It it, it feels removed from most of the album. Yeah. It, like sure. it it could it, it could actually fit into tomorrow's harvest, but. 
uh, it's, it's a similar song to that of like the next one, uh, Gyroscope, which is a folk track. And it's very similar to You Could Feel Sky and like uh, with, with, with the drum design, you know? Mm. Because, because it's, I think it's very unique how I use stereo, especially in Gyroscope, you know? It, 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 it moves from your ears and it, it feels very three dimensional when you're listening to it with headphones on at least. Definitely. Just, I don't know. Not not every artist can do that well because usually when people use stereo as like a, a artistic tool, they they kind of just do this, you know, schizophrenic two voices right left mm. thing. But yeah. they actually know how to how to move around sound. I think Gyroscope is like honestly one of the most like unsettling tracks on on the album. I don't know. Like I don't know, it just it just it's it's just anxiety inducing. Like, it's like the, being a uh, it's like being in a torture chamber. Yeah, and literally. these guys are rolling you around in a in a office chair, and this kid is saying numbers, and you just wanted to leave, you know? Just it's very much like bad acid trip acid acid trip vibes. Yeah, it's a it's a really solid track though. I do like it. Yeah, le- like, le- yeah. Like I said, it's it's not very easy to do. That whole stereo thing and actually make it sound good. And I think this is like the, the first reveal of like these number stations, you know? Mm. Uh, yeah. but back in the Cold War days, they had like these number stations that just played these, these codes for the spies. And then they eventually just got out of use, but there's still like some remaining that still play these codes. And they're really obsessed with it. Yeah. Because, uh, one one of the tracks we're gonna get to is like called Over the Horizon Radar, which is, uh, I think an anti missile missile, uh, radar, which just plays into the whole Cold War theme, you know. Yeah, for sure. And I think with a lot of these interviews, interludes, sorry, um, they feel like kind of like radio transmissions. Yeah. Um, I think they are most of them, to be honest. Yeah, they are. Uh, <laughs> they're really obsessed with shortwave radio. Yeah, um, which, yeah, I guess leads us on to Dandelion, which is, like, what is it? Is it, like, a... It's from a documentary. Okay. Is it, like, a... Like, is that, like, a nature documentary, I guess? It, it, it's it's about, well, these... Volcanoes. Volcano daddy, dandelions. And I can... <laughs> it's, it's so... When, when you've heard the albums of, uh, a few times, you can actually recite the whole thing. It's, it's like, yeah, very... Yeah, It's It's... it's it puts you in a trance. I don't know. Yeah. Like when lava pull up, pulls out near the sea surface, tremendous yeah. volcanic explosions sometimes occur. Yeah. You know, it's it's sure. it's very. It first sounds very like strange. Like why are you putting this here? Mm. But after a while, he it's kind of melodic. Like it has a rhythm. You know, especially with just sound in the background. That's so f- interesting as well because like. You know how earlier I was talking about how you could feel the sky gives me like nature documentary vibes. Yeah, um, and one tracks actually like, nature. Yeah, and then this one, I feel like that's just the thing with this album is like it's so. I think their music works on. I don't know. I want. I don't want to throw around, throw around the word subconscious, but like it works on that level where like I'm not in, exactly in computing why I kind of visualize certain things, and I feel like loads of different tracks on this album like a, a random mix of them were kind of weirdly informed by like other stuff on the album as well like i maybe wouldn't have even kind of thought that with other tracks if i hadn't heard dandelion or like i don't know it's it's just interesting it also makes sense like with the whole nature documentary vibe because i mean that's literally where they got their name from you know like mm. uh natural film boards of canada which is like, uh, they, as kids, I watch a lot of these documentaries by them. So, you know, in, in a way, they're kind of playing off that typical yeah. sound that you hear from it, but, you know, yeah. differently. Of course, a lot of their stuff is is up for interpretation, but I think that's just an example of where it's like, I think in some ways, like, there are obviously, like, consistent themes within their music, like, and they're obviously, and it, they know what they're doing. Maybe like yeah. a lot of people, you can kind of read a lot into everything. 
Yeah, you kind of they're like really in tune with um, the beliefs, you know, like mm-hmm. loving nature, uh, peace, but they're not hippies in any yeah. way. They're just small, really genuine about uh, the things they want to preserve, you know. And I think um, that plays into the last, well, it's not the last album, but the last one they released. Uh, Thomas Havas was like bleak because uh, during that time, uh, future just seemed really bleak because yeah. global warming and you know threats of nuclear war even in 2014. I mean, yeah, mm, yeah. And it's just like, well, you people ruined it. <laughs> Here's this album about it. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, if you even you think about the title, Tomorrow's Harvest, and you look at the cover, it's all like very apocalyptic yeah it's it's, it's, yeah. it's uh also like very clearly uh an allusion to you reap what you sow so mm. tomorrow's harvest is what you reap right so i guess on to sunshine recorder yeah and i think that's like the first one where you can tell there's like a difference now in theme because before like dandelion all the tracks before dandelion are like clearly uh in their own well, I like to call it like separate rooms, and then you enter a different room, and it's sunshine recorder. You know. I agree. Yeah, I think in terms of like, if you bunch up sun sunshine recorder all the way to like nineteen, maybe not to, to nineteen sixty nine, but like it's kind of. I think this is the first time where they're using like that reverse kind of sample, mm. or because it reminds that that's how with this track like. Sunshine Recorder sort of reminds me of obviously a song later on on the album, which is 1969, where it's like, yeah, it's it's using that like reverse. And like, I guess most some people would be like, oh, it's kind of demonic, like, you know, it's backwards and stuff. I actually think it's, it's quite peaceful. I don't know. Yeah, I think this is this is also another track on the album is like one of my favorites, Sunshine Recorder. Like, yeah, like, like, like you mentioned before, like the synth walk is just... I don't know, really unique. You can't really replicate it because it, it has this very calm aura that's also very terrifying with like the the um distorted voices in the background, but yeah, and if, and if you're not really like into this kind of music, of course it's gonna sound demonic, but mm-hmm. the more you listen to it, the more you realize it's uh it's actually quite beautiful. Like in in its in the, not not just the way it sounds, but also in its composition, you can hear like the transitions between um, each instrument, and you can feel, you can clearly tell there's a structure, you know. Definitely. Yeah, I think that's before. especially like clear with this one because a lot of the songs before this are kind of built up of repetition, and like yeah, yeah, like so like music is math and gyroscope kind of feel like they're in their own like bubble, I guess. Well, I, that's also kind of sort of how I would. I mean, you've got the example with like the rooms and stuff, but it's how I'd bunch up some other tracks on this, like Sunshine Recorder and like 1969. Well, I guess yeah, it's like I'd say I agree how with how it sort of is beautiful and so, sort of soothing in a way, but like I think there's something more hooky about these songs, like Sunshine Recorder and 1969. Um, yeah, then a not in a typical post. way. Like obviously, there's not somebody like singing a, a chorus or anything. And in in the song "Sunshine Recorder," they say like "beautiful place," and that's like another clear tell that they record all of our songs way before. You know, because mm. "beautiful place" is like from the EP in a beautiful yeah. place out in the country, so it was probably recorded with the intention for it to be on that. You know. Mm, yeah. Or at least it shows that, like, yeah, they're just all their w- process with their, like, just making music is very like streamlined. Like they're always doing it, and it's not like, yeah. It, it, oh yeah, it just shows that they've clearly just got like a massive like bank of songs and stuff, and they're always used like they're just always producing shit. I guess. Yeah, but but they're clearly like not just putting them on the album, but they're doing more with appropriating it, appropriating you know? it to yeah. The, yeah yeah that's like, it yeah exactly like. Yeah, like with how I think there's some other stuff that you like you've mentioned, like the rule the world thing is kind of on Geogardi as well, or at least it's uh, or it's sounding, yeah. sounding similar. I'm sure they've done. I'm sure there's more cases of 
where they've used like assets or like sound design from like previous albums on future albums. And actually, yeah, I take back what I said about how like I think I was waffling on a bit about how like it feels more like hooky and like memorable. And I think that's because yeah, the beautiful place thing is sort of like it is kind of a hook. Um, yeah. Kind of like how uh, in Happy Cycling the seagulls are like the that's the hook in that song. Demonic seagulls. Yeah. But it's also like a really memorable hook. Like I feel like they really know how to like it's obviously not conventional on how it's a hook, but it it yeah. very clearly is. It's like it's like, it's like I, an... how memorable are those seagulls? I'm sure everybody remembers the the, the sound of the seagulls on Happy Cycling. Yeah, the thing is, that's like a really basic concept in uh, classical music. You know, you have like this main theme that mm. you uh, play on. You know, like it's it, it doesn't stay consistent, but uh, it always changes. You know, like a uh, Beethoven's uh, fifth, which is like a really weird thing to talk about with Boards of Canada, but <laughs> it makes sense. You know, like this, this da 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 da, it changes every time yeah. uh, it, throughout the whole thing. And that's kind of the same way um, with their repetitive stuff. You know, like it doesn't, it's not consistent, but it's still repetitive. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. This exactly, is like a main yeah. team. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and not just with like the beautiful place thing, but there are like those other sampled vocals like within it. And stuff so it just makes it does make it feel like a more conventional song structure but still obviously like not conventional by any means because it's like on geo gabby yeah especially you can tell when the songs end like the the few rep uh, repetitions blend out and just go quiet and the, the main melody comes back you know mm, yeah it reveals sure. itself yeah exactly but and i, I think the, the title as well like sunshine recorder like we, we've already discussed a lot about how like we bunch up these kind of subconsciously i guess in a way like bunch up these songs and like create their own order in a weird way and like sunshine recorder for me is like and kind of like 1969 and even july and candy has got like this kind of like daytime like really harsh sunlight vibe to it yeah i don't know I like kind of that. murderous but like i don't know how to ex explain but murderous sun <laughs> Yeah, like, I don't know. Like, just like, makes like the moon and, and like the moon yeah. and uh, Zelda, but the sun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think Julian Candy comes after the next one, uh, and what is what is it again? In the annex. Yeah, which is also an interesting transitional piece, you know, like uh, interlude, hmm. because you know, annex is like a what is it again? Next door building, you know, so it goes into the next building next room <laughs> and it's such a basic track with like it's repetitious uh, piano I almost i don't know it's not a it's like a very weird piano i don't know what it is i'm not gonna lie i, I would just call it a synth but mm, yeah and it's, it's i don't know they did they, they somehow managed to make the most basic melodies very interesting and ominous I think that that's sure. we're just repeating ourselves, but that's true. So yeah, but I think that there's not actually that much to say about this track. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, not really. I think it's a mean, well placed interlude. Yeah. Yeah. But also and, very, but also very. I mean, up up until this point, we've been given a a mix of very different tracks anyway, and yeah. Um. So yeah, it's like it's fitting, but also very different from Sunshine Recorder are, like, very different from these other tracks. But I think it, 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 it really does exist to, like, transition into Julian Candy. Yeah. Because it, it, it does it very well. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Because it, it goes from, like, this very slow synth into this really fast, um, what do you even call it? Like, yeah, it's it's a, it's a flute uh, in mm -hmm. Julian Candy. Right? Yeah. I think they, 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 they recorded like yeah. they recorded a bunch of um, flutes uh, and and just kind of bounce it back and forth. I'm reading the interview. They they say they they bounce it back and forth between the internal mics of two tape decks until the sound started disappearing into hell. And that's pretty true. Yeah. So so we basically just just took a recorder and made it sound demonic. Yeah. They, they, I think that's that's the whole approach. Just record something like a flute and just uh put it into a tape recorder back and forth until it sounds anything but a flute 
Yeah. And yeah, I, I totally get that. Yeah. Yeah, and and again, it's this, this really unique thing that's just like every single one of the songs because you can't really replicate that kind of thing because they work. I think that's something not a lot of people know, but they should. It's they don't do digital. They only do analog. Like all of the yeah. albums are analog, um, which is why you should actually buy it in as, as a vinyl mm. because it's kind of stupid to buy a vinyl when it was recorded digitally, but like both of Canada when it's analog it's it's really unique when you listen to it on vinyl I think it's like it really yeah, I agree. experience yeah. yeah yeah it actually makes sense for them yeah for um, sure yeah and another thing about a track which I always found interesting and it's very grim is it could it, that is like a a great like chance that it's about a murder like Julian Canny, it's like this, um, what is it, uh, Candace Newmaker and Julie, I forgot her last um, name. Yeah. Um, but it was basically like a like a kid uh, that got adopted and this uh, adopted mother wanted her to like um, not be attached to her old mother or something. I don't really remember. But essentially she was murdered. Um, during like this this rebirth thing that where, where they put them in this box or machine, I forgot like into blankets and they basically well it's pretty grim I'm sorry, <laughs> but she no, was sen- she, she was essentially uh, killed that way by adults which I think again plays into this whole fleeting childhood thing you know, yeah. um it's like this yeah, this kid sure. that got murdered for the, like no reason at all. Because adults are just stupid. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I remember like hearing something about this track where it was like that about that. I probably um, said. That. <laughs> yeah, you probably said. I I think like. Ah, uh, yeah. I don't know. It's it's and uh, again like that whole thing as well. You know how I just randomly said like this section of the album is like sunshine, sh- sunshine, murderous vibes. Like I'm probably pulling that murderous thing from Julian Candy. And then also 1969, because it's all about, like, David Koresh and stuff. So, I mean, yeah. And also, it's, even 1969 is, like, 1969 in the sunshine. So, yeah. Uh, another that thing... That is literally, like, you know, death in the sun, you know? Death, oh, God. It's, it's really grim, but that's just... That's just the album. Yeah. Uh, and, and another thing that I think starts here... It's like this repeating sample of this movie, uh, Season of the Witch. Mm. It's like a 70s film. Okay. That that is used in like most songs on this album, and I still haven't seen it, but I should. It's uh, I think it's really interesting that they that they sample a specific movie. I think this track is also like um one of the brighter songs on the album. I don't think there's really any like it definitely sounds like I guess yeah they're making a flute sound as demonic as possible, but. I still think it's the most upbeat, in my personal opinion. Yeah, it's like the only dark thing is the title, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like I think the context of the, you know, the and, potential. Yeah, and, and and most people don't even know that. I think, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's it's, it's sure. quite. Uh, it's not on the nose. It's very much in. So. Yeah. Exactly. But we know like what they were sort of inspired by at the time, and it's like it's a very like. Sorry, like, dark yes. things. It's not like yeah. a super, like a massive reach or anything. I think that's probably what it is based off of. Um, yeah, probably. But then again, like, you know, they're just giving a track that title, so it's it's not like they musically represented that that whole event, but they more so put yeah. that title. I think that that that, that murder, like uh, involuntary, or whatever, happened like two years before the album was released. So I can oh, see yeah. how that would, you know. They yeah, heard about that and probably. Yeah, they might they might have even made it right after, you know, because yeah, obviously they don't release stuff like that. Was, but... Maybe it was even called like the song was called something else, but to, like I don't know. Yeah. Give yeah, give, give this child like yeah, but but like it, probably in a, in a very nice way, you know. Yeah, I agree. It commemorates the memory of her or something. Yeah, I think that's a nice way of thinking about it, especially with how like kind of like peppy the song feels like in contrast to everything else in the album in my yeah. opinion. like again in my opinion cause... but it's really sad i think just when when you actually go deep into the whole childhood theme 
Yeah. You can see the point with uh, just how different the world is that you perceive. Mm, for sure. Yeah, that's yeah. it was I remember reading up on re- reading up on that case and it's like a really like sad story, isn't it? Like Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but from sad <laughs> <laughs> sad into the next room, which is uh unless you want to say something more about that No, I was gonna go on to the smallest yeah. room number as well. Yeah, which is I, I love telling people this. <laughs> The smallest word number is 70, which is also the name of the own label, uh, Music Symphony. But they're like really obsessed with just, uh, with number theory and stuff. I think one of them studied uh, mathematics, like AI or something like that. I don't remember, but it was definitely maths related. So that makes sense. Like the obsession with uh, Fibonacci sequence, golden ratio, and well, weird numbers. Like that's an actual thing in mathematics. Yeah. Uh, well, there are numbers that you can't like, like they have, they have like specific um, things about them that other numbers just don't have. So they're called weird numbers, and yeah, the smallest one, as the title says, is seventy, which they're really obsessed with. Seventeen or seventeen. Like, seventy. Okay, all right. Yeah. I'm trying to think of what makes seventy weird. It's like a, a like a weird number is a number reading off wikipedia uh because i don't study math uh, a weird number is a number that is abundant but not semi-perfect so like mm. i don't know it's something really like if, if you read it it makes sense uh, saying it out loud won't really make you understand but like uh like like if if you add all the numbers in 70 like one plus two plus three plus five like uh you, you can't something like I don't know. It's it's very complicated. Yeah, it's that's not logic really behind com- it. Though. Yeah. yeah, but it's really interesting. Um, and the song is uh like seventy seconds long. Okay. Yeah. Which is funny. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> so a case I... of obviously they deliberately made maybe I don't know. I mean, is it is that there's not really much point of like guessing whether or not they they choose a title before they make a song or then or if it's the other way around, but like. Obviously, that song is 70 seconds, so... But I think it plays into the idea of it's, like, nature documentary, especially with this track. Mm. I can, like, see these these deers standing around in a forest and this song playing. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. You say deers? Yeah. Or yeah. deer. Yeah. yeah. Oh, dear, yeah. <laughs> um... what, about, what about the plural of deers? Yeah, I think this the the synths in this one as well remind me of like the stuff on music has the right to children as well. Like I just think there's like that's another point where it's it's funny how you can kind of recognize like different stuff from different eras. Um but anyway, moving on uh to 1969. Um in the sunshine. Yeah. <laughs> uh Yeah, so this is obviously I think this one is like the most hooky track to me. This is, you know, when I said like with the hook on Sunshine Recorder, just like that repeat of like, um, is it like, although not a follower of something? David Koresh. Yeah. Is that just reversed like over and over again? I think another thing about is this, it, it fits into in a beautiful place out in the country again. Cause it's, yeah. that, it's that same theme with the cult of the branch of idioms. Mm. yeah yeah for sure and it's just it's just when you listen to it maybe it's because they actually say in the sunshine but you can actually feel it yeah for no, sure yeah i don't know it's, it's 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 not really my favorite track i i tend to actually skip it sometimes when i listen to the album fair enough <laughs> I, yeah i think i remember i don't know why that. yeah because it's it's not a bad song but it's just not my kind of thing to listen to it's 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 almost too uplifting, and I think deceivingly, you know? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I think there's something... The reason why I like it so much, personally, is, like, it's kind of... It's, like, very... Like, of course, a lot of these songs, like, kind of put you in a trance, but, like, this one, like, the repetitive nature of, like, the hook, I don't know why it just does it for me. Like, I really like it. It's really... It's a really interesting hook. I don't know. I think that repeated phrase is, like... Oh, yeah. The oh no, I just think that is really memorable. I guess. 
It's actually also one of the few songs where I performed live once. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Um... But it sounds the thing about my live versions is they just sound completely different. Yeah, I'm sure they like, sound better as well. Like, right? Like I don't know, just really strange. Or just different, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I I think when you say like it might be a song that you tend to skip more, I kind of I can actually notice the difference between 19, 1969 and a lot of other tracks. Where like I think 1969 has like the least variation. Out of yeah, that. yeah. Um, that's true. Yeah, that's what I noticed. Anyway, just within the structure as well, like, it doesn't really change up that much. Maybe it gets like a, a bit louder, but that's it. Yeah, and and I think I do skip it because like the next two songs are like my favorite. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> so I just had to get to that part quickly. Yeah, to me, you know? but to me, this branch of like. You know how we have this idea of like kind of like segments of the album. I feel like this is where that that branch ends from like Dandelion to 1969 for me personally into Energy Warning, which is the next track. Um, yeah, I I really 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 love this because not not because of like the I don't think you can it's it's a track it's not really a song uh, because of the way it flows into the beat at rap point. Mm. Like, I like to think of a connected, you know, like, uh, Energy Warning has, like, this 70s public service announcement of, like, this kid basically saying, uh, you know, in the future, there's going to be climate change if we continue using um, oil and gas and whatnot, and, uh, you know, and, and it's, 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 it's this child, you know, so... It's like pleading with the adults again. It's like this human Julian Candy. That's like adults exploiting children in a way mm. for their own gain. Because well, yeah. in this case, like like exploiting them so they can use all the natural resources. Uh, so the children are left with nothing and uh, grim world. And I think it's like in the seventies too. Like most people think, oh, uh, global warming and energy crisis. That's a, it's a modern thing. Like no, no. <laughs> That that are more worries about that in the seventies too, yeah. You know, um, and unless you have anything else to say about it, we could. I guess the uh, the only other thing I would say about it is like kind of the there's like a watery sample at the beginning. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I just think that ties nicely into the beats of Red Point. Um, yeah, that's what, that's what I was gonna say because yeah. you know you you go from this like energy warning this this like love for nature and uh you know humans evil blah blah <laughs> mm. into the beach at rap point you know it's like uh this is the, the beautiful thing that uh we will this this child wants to conserve like but but that should remain in the future you know which mm. which also kind of plays into tomorrow's harvest which is grimmer like this this is like a more hopeful album you know mm. Can yeah. especially tell with like these two tracks, Energy Warning and a Beach at Red Point, because uh, the contrast in Tomorrow's Harvest is that's it's very industrial, you know? Yeah. Like sure. very, very ap- ap- apocalyptic and that's very deliberate. Um and it's like there is no nature, you know? Mm. That's what it feels like. And here it's like very hopeful that the the like the, the, the uh, theme of nature is very omnipresent in the album especially in these two tracks uh yeah for sure i think and, this is where the track list kind of starts to get a lot more like atmospheric as well personally yeah i see what you um, mean i mean of course there's a, there's a lot of atmosphere within boards of canada's music anyway but like this specifically like it shifts much more onto like the nature side of things like the nature theme at this yeah point. um not just and, and, the beach at Red Point, but you know. Yeah, and I think it's just it's they're really good at naming that uh, songs. You hear the beach at Red Point, and then you actually listen to it, and at, at least I can like see waves, uh, and the actual beach, and it's just the sun, you know, and and it, it, it's yeah. just, it sounds yeah. ridiculous, but when you've actually listened to it quite a few times, it makes so much sense of like the synths getting louder. And yeah. uh, this 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 moving um, what do you even call it? It's, 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 I don't know what it is. What's that? It's it's, it's, it's like a bouncy synth. <laughs> I 
I don't know, but it sounds kind of like aquatic, weirdly. Yeah, 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 opinion. yeah. Def- yeah, that's that's a good description. And I don't know. It, it, it's it's not very easy to um, evoke the same image in in a listener's head. Yeah. Oh yeah. You I, have. I think honestly, I, I was gonna say the same thing with this with this track, the beach at Red Point, where it's like, I've really, I don't, I think I've not really, we haven't really talked enough about like how, yeah, just how good they are at like naming their tracks, in general, like yeah, every, I, it's, it's all so like appropriately titled, um, but I guess it's funny, like I wonder, like, it'd be cool like to experiment, do an experiment, like show somebody at boards a Canada song and then ask them what they think of it and then like show them like you know the, the yeah title. Well, it's like, okay how much how much of my like audio visual experience is informed by the title of the song you know what i mean we should but then again but then again like i don't at the end of the day like it doesn't really matter because either way it's there and that's like what's important um, but it's interesting but it is interesting yeah i'd want to know like if that's we should, yeah. we should conduct the an experiment the relation between those like two things is interesting hmm. um but yeah, but, but it sounds like a thing you could write like a whole uh, essay about about how you yeah, know sure. yeah. tiles evoke something or just listening to it. Do you, do you think of the same thing? Yeah, I mean, Very I think that's like it's like a extension of like the concept of like oh, do album co- what's the impact of like an album cover on on like a listening experience? I guess. But I think I think all of that actually, to be honest, it really just depends on like the type of music because, like I said, like some music is more visual yeah and there's you get more imagery from it than than others and like boards of canada is obviously like a good example of that so um but yeah that is an interesting thing maybe i'll do that yeah no, it's it's, it's it, it, i don't know when i listen to the beach at rap point i get like this very like great as in like the size of mm. that's what yeah that's that's another thing i think that's i said it's more atmospheric but i think i just think instead of maybe saying that i think it just kind of becomes a bit not grander but like just a lot more open the space is a lot more open i feel like the it's everything up until that point has felt like a lot more like claustrophobic sounding yeah confined yeah yeah whereas this when i say atmosphere it i mean that this track kind of it's kind of there's it's still obviously very complex, but there's a lot of more like breathing room for like that, for that um, main synth to like carry it forward. Um, yeah, and, and I think I that's think like that's the, the as well. yeah, that's that's definitely deliberate because yeah. they they put an emphasis on like a very anti um, industrialization is something you realize when you read it, like themselves are like anti globalization because of the way it drives population numbers up and it creates like more uh, apartment complexes and destroys nature you know mm. and i think that's it's like the main goal of the music is to like show that nature is something bigger than us and i think in this song you can definitely tell that that because the, the, the surrounding sounds it just feels so grand like you said and um you just feel so small when you listen to it yeah totally yeah but it's also just yeah i think it's just I think it's just beautiful like I think like there's a lot to set like that can be said about how like perfectly they kind of like depict these natural settings and kind of like yeah. the beauty of those and like how yeah it should just like how vital it is to preserve those those like environments I guess you know yeah it does does feel very important and like yeah when it comes in in at this point in the track list it just feels so like natural this is from energy warning like this is what will happen if like you don't you know if you don't protect this yeah like this goes away yeah yeah, like it just feels like a a big change of pace but like a good for a good reason i guess and that's definitely why i love it because they managed to say so much without actually saying anything i know yeah it's it's amazing because that's so hard to do. It's like the, nowadays, especially people feel the need to explain everything, even mm. themselves, and put themselves into like these boxes, whereas they just kind of are like very anti that, and they're like, 
um, what we do speaks for itself. And if you need that to be explained, like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah honestly, it's crazy. It's just, yeah. And I'm sure this is, these are the kind of conversations that they want like people to be having. I guess. Yeah, it's, instead of the demonic sample. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's, it's so much, it can be so much more interesting than that, for sure. Yeah, like, which is so like, being, like, this it's album a... was an acid trip, bro. You know? <laughs> that was a good American accent. Really? I feel like I always fuck that up, to be honest. Nah. But, um, yeah, I just really loved this song so much. It's, 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 it's like a good acid trip. It's not like, um, which one, which one was a bad one? That's what I mean. That's what I mean. Um, I was saying that earlier with the album where it's like, I definitely can get behind the whole, like, yeah, it feels like an acid trip type of vibe mixed um, one <laughs> yeah no but no but yeah but that's that's the reality of what a trip is usually like it is usually True, full of ups yeah. and downs like i'm not i don't even think i'm reading too much into it i think genuinely and that's like a lot of how i interpret the album i think i mean if i want to go further with it i think obviously like life and like even again with the whole concept of like aging and adolescence like it's full of ups and downs so i think how kind of emotionally like and sonically bipolar the album felt like it's kind of structured is for a reason um i don't know that just resonates particularly with me uh, yeah 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 it's, it's definitely true especially of like the point of how hopeful this album actually is yeah for you know, sure. it's like it's like this this bad thing could happen and we it was this beautiful thing so like whereas in like tomorrow's harvest it's just bleak all around there's nothing yeah. <laughs> there's exactly, nothing yeah no hope there's really no hope yeah and i guess like i mean it, it might be going off in a bit of a tangent but that's like what a podcast is about really but um i guess that come like when you really think about like do boards of canada need to release something else i guess it's just in terms of like what's the current climate of like today i guess like i feel like True. everything they've released yeah. in the past has been for a reason and if it's not been reflective of the world now it's that's just because they hadn't gotten to a point to like represent that proper properly. So I only say that because obviously like they released like music has the right and Geo Gotti, like pretty close together, but they did all of that within quite a short burst, like relatively like all of that whole album run of like, uh, yeah, music has the right Geo Gotti, campfire head phase, like all the EPs and stuff. Um, but then with Tomorrow's Harvest, it felt like they came back to it because they were like, oh, yeah, we, obviously they do have something to say, I guess, for a reason yeah, to make music. Yeah, that's interesting. I had the same thought earlier. You know, like, they don't really... There's always this need to, like, release something. And, of course, you should release what you created. It's kind of unfair if you create something and you don't release it. Like, why? I don't know. <laughs> it's criminal. Yeah. But, but yeah. with them, it's like, I think they really do put an emphasis on putting out a message that's not really direct but if it does reflect like the current climate mm, in a way yeah. not not necessarily the current one but it could also be the one in the future or a past one with like uh some songs you know like from the 70s and stuff like that yeah for but, sure, yeah. But the weird thing is, like, I don't really know where music has to write to children would fit into. I that literally concept. was, yeah, I was literally just <laughs> thinking that as you were saying that. It's like, music has, the, the more I think about it, music has the right to children, children is so much, like, it's really not as environmentally focused as, like, Geo Gotti and Tomorrow's Harvest. It's, I think it's more focused on just... Nostalgia. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's the word, um, yeah. I think it's, like, yeah. I don't know. I think it maybe if if you were gonna treat that again, like treat their discography as a timeline, I think music has the right to children comes at a point where you're a kid and you don't even think about those things anyway, and you're having a fun time. Yeah, and then the bad adults come. <laughs> yeah, I guess. And basically take away everything that's like important for you to experience or something. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I I really always love the way they present their views yeah it's not on the nose but the more you actually think about it the more you kind of connect with the artist you know yeah and about... i think that's yeah i think it's like with boards of canada like what they are is is literally like 
they what they are is not on the nose like that's how they like operate you know which is yeah. like what's so special about them it's like not on the nose it's not pretension pretentious like by any means like it's just i don't know like a love for like obviously making their music and also telling i don't know just creating work that is interpretational i guess and like spreading their message and stuff yeah so I like them. I don't know. Yeah, I think we've <laughs> already I... said like so many fucking. We're just gushing about, about them, but honestly, that's the point of this. I know it's it's nice to. I think it's nice to um yeah talk about them again because I always forget like it's it's good to remember like why you like give a shit about these artists and stuff. Yeah. In the first place. Like, and I think most... Woods of Canada is a rare one where like I really do like overanalyze like you know like sometimes you know there's a so much to talk about because it's they're easily like sort of the most open-ended um, yeah they're know. very they're very listener friendly if you think about it yeah they leave room oh. for your imagination whereas like most artists when you tell them you think this and this of the song hmm. and then they tell you what they actually thought about and what they think it's about and yeah. that, that just becomes like the the, the the main thing man you know there's yeah. no room left for you to interpret anything it was yeah they deliberately say uh, interpret your own thing as that, you know. Mm, I mean, yeah. there's some really weird people that interpret sat- Satanism or whatever into it, but that's not the mm. point. I think they just see the color red. They see the six six six. They see the yeah, but it's they see really their, like symmetry and stuff, and they're like, oh, you know, like those are the kinds of people that actually, you know, and wouldn't really enjoy this type of music. Mm, totally, no, they, yeah. they, they, they'd rather listen to something where the artist is like clear about their intention and uh that's not a bad thing you know like mm. not everybody has the same listening habits or mm. likes the same things i think that's what people forget that, like yeah. opinions opinions are different and that's okay yeah yeah totally yeah. you don't have to like everything everybody else likes yeah especially if you're a guy like yeah yeah for sure i don't know how, how, how... From your experience, like within the fandom, or like maybe not even within the fan base, but like just generally, like who would you say like the which is the more favored album? Like music has a right or Geo Gotti? Mm. I feel like Geo Gotti is like what I would define as like the fan favorite, like quote unquote. But like, uh, but weirdly enough, I don't, I don't, I think most people like music has a right to children. Yeah, same. even even within like boards of Canada circles, whatever. Uh, People tend to like call Chigari more experimental, you know. Like it's, I it's, think people refer to music as a right to children as the classic, definitely. Yeah, it's it's a classic, but it's like most most people wouldn't say. I mean, maybe there's like a fifty fifty split, you know, music as a right yeah. to children and Chigari. I think it's probably fifty fifty actually. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I that's think... the reason why I even asked the question because it's like probably so fifty fifty. Yeah, because yeah. I think most most people would agree that it's like the most out that album Mm, they they, they really went in and said uh, we're gonna try everything (laughs) yeah i think they just i think personally like obviously music as a right is still an amazing album but i think it's just geo gaudi is just an improvement it's not going for the same thing but it's just like in terms of structure and like just everything that makes boards of canada good they did better on geo gaudi yeah and i think that's our goal you know to like yeah. change every album there's no consistency with their sound which is amazing and hard mm. to do but they but they basically they they managed to build a fan base that is okay with that which is hard i mean yeah sure. ask any artist especially like the very very popular they wouldn't dare do that yeah totally it's anyway. unfortunate yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's 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 true yeah um so uh, moving on we have opening the mouth which is another inter- interlude of course um this feels like just yeah directly just kind of an interlude off of the beach at red point it just sounds sonically mm-hmm. very yeah, very similar I, I like to imagine a cloud blowing wind <laughs> i don't know mm. oh like uh, yeah there's like this kind of whispery yeah very, very it's ethereal. such a strange sound, but it's really, yeah, it's very ethereal. It kind of, 
I don't know. I'm probably just like a grouper stand, but it kind of reminds me of how like grouper uses her voice in some of her stuff. Um, just the way it's like mixed around and it feels like very hushed. Um, but yeah, it's really nice. And it, it comes, it kind of works really well as like a follow up after the beach at Red Point. I guess what do you yeah. picture as well? Is it just like clouds and stuff? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> most, 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 most cartoon clouds of eyes. Mm, yeah. So kind of evil. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I guess and, George's uh, going to Alpha Omega, I guess. Yeah. And I think an interesting thing about that is, uh, like, it's Alpha and Omega is like uh, the beginning and the end. Okay, so, like, yeah. in, in, in a Greek alphabet, it's like the, it's like A to Z. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Z, whatever you want to say. <laughs> yeah. But, I'm, trying um, to, I'm trying to listen back to Alpha and Omega right now, actually, because I can't remember too much about the song. But. It's it's actually not that, like, it's, it's not that interesting, I think. Hmm. The, the, the beat is very repetitive, but I think that's, that's not the point of the song. It's, it's, it's seven minutes for a reason. Kind of, it kind of uh, takes you out of the previous vibe. I think, and and, and I like to like call like opening the mouth is like the next mm. room, you know. Yeah, I you, hear that. You, yeah. you left the nature area and you joined the, I don't know. Alpha and Omega. Alpha and science, Omega area. Science area. I don't know. The science lab. Yeah, yeah. Because it, this is where it gets into the whole, um, like number stations and everything mm, yeah yeah and like yeah, the next this is like called... yeah i find it sorry just to interrupt but like um yeah it's it's i obviously should have like remembered like how this song kind of was, was sounded but i genuinely like this is one of the songs that i like kind of rem- i find like a bit less memorable memorable compared to yeah the but you still don't skip it when you actually play the album. Skip, yeah yeah like, listen to the album but like it sounds more like I'm just I'm more confused at like what the direction or like the vibe of the song is like it just sounds kind of maybe similar in a way to like how like music is math kind of functions like just as a general track um mm. it's not very visual it's not as visual to me um in my opinion maybe I mean, kind of science labby though I see what you mean yeah yeah um, chemical I don't know <laughs> no I know what you mean like it's kind of like those Although it's got a really playful, yeah, it's definitely got that playful vibe to it again, kind of yeah, like it's how like being uh, lost in a labyrinth as a kid. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, but it sounds. I don't know. It sounds like kind of an interlude and a song and a, and like a track. Uh, yeah, a song at the same time. For, to yeah, me, even though it's seven minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's so it's really long, isn't it? It's really interesting because like the next track is like called "I Saw Drones." Mm-hmm. Which is I don't know how how that goes from Alpha and Omega, you know, a phrase that's in the Bible, <laughs> to I saw drones. Mm. I don't know. I I never. It's it's uh, yeah. the shortest song, right? Yeah, it's twenty seven seconds. And I don't know. That's how you get your scrubbles. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, it doesn't even scrubble, dude. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. Oh, yeah, because it doesn't. Yeah, thing. it has like zero plays. It doesn't have something, or like maybe two plays. Or something. Yeah, because it has to be thirty seconds. Yeah, yeah, that's it's not. Um, maybe that's just the purpose of it. They were just like trying to reduce people's scrubbles. Sorry, yeah, that's think... really not funny. I'm gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I like the vibe of the song of this interlude. I saw drones or I thought, oh my god. Yeah. Uh, no, I saw drones. Oh, yeah. I, I really like the title. It's like, I don't know. Yeah, it's like, what does that mean? Like, that's one thing where I'm like, it fit, I think it fits the sound of the song, but like, I just. I, I, maybe... I think this maybe goes back to the whole thing where it's like, they're not trying to create a perfect sequence of things. Like, yeah. going from opening the mouth. To Alpha and Omega and I saw drones. I mean, maybe I'm like giving more credit where it's due, but it feels like a deliberate effort to make it feel more confusing again of an album. Like it doesn't 
I don't know. I just don't know where we are in in the GeoGaddy story timeline and like the GeoGaddy storyline. I don't know yeah. where we are. Um, Controlled confusion. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that plays into the next track, which is like uh, "The Devil Is in the Details," mm-hmm. which again plays with like the title being um, relevant to the song. Because in this case, like the detail is that the song is, uh, well, according to an interview, one of them said that's like an equation, and it's true. It's like a golden ratio. If you, uh, something with the baseline and, uh, you know, the difference between it, blah, blah, it, it, it's a golden ratio. And uh, when, a, when a title plays with the song, I think it's very interesting. I think it happens in DJ, with, with DJ Shadow uh, in, in, in his dead debut album that's this track called uh why hip-hop sucks in 96 Mm -hmm. and the song doesn't make sense unless you read the title because it's like the guy says it's the money uh and you're like what do you mean it's the money when you read the title it's this is why hip-hop sucks now yeah Yeah, for sure yeah (laughs) you know and it's the same thing with this song it's like um you know the title is like suggesting there's something more deep deeper hidden in this track Mm. and there is yeah for sure Canada. It's like very boards of Canada to make a track like that and like call it that and do that. I don't know if that's yeah. worth saying, but like it just seems like, yeah, like hide the golden ratio within your song and then call it dev- the devils in the details. Yeah, but it's also it's also like six six six, and if you uh, something with the melody, how, how many times the melody repeats or something? Oh really? Like you get six six six. Yeah. Like ooh, but it's. It, I, I really enjoy when you actually put effort into your titles, like we already mentioned, but yeah. Yeah, they're so, yeah, they're so, like, yeah. Just well. It's like, it's, like I said, they, they're very listener-friendly. They, they, they play with you mm. indirectly. Yeah, for sure. It's like a very active listening experience. Yeah. It's a very ominous song as well, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. All of that. Song what you would together. expect from a song called The Devil and is in the details. And yeah, yeah, of course, all of them are ominous, but um, yeah, this one. Yeah, is- I think it's again. Uh, I think it, it it samples that 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 movie again that I mentioned after, like the voice that's talking, right? Am I wrong? I don't know. No, actually, it's something random. Never mind. Nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I mean. It's so ominous. Like, wh- where yeah. do you get the sample? I mean, the next track is again like very nerdy. Like yeah. A is to B as B is to C is again uh maths, the golden ratio. It's what you learn in school essentially. Yeah. Uh and they really love playing with uh like like I said, with these numbers. They're like really obsessed with uh mm-hmm. I don't want to call it numerology, that's something else. Uh, number theory, that's it, yeah. And also just uh, maths ex- exists outside of this like science vacuum because it's not really um, empirical. Em- empirical is like something you can actually see. It's like yeah. human made and uh, it only makes sense with like the rules we made. Mm, it's yeah. very interesting how I play with it. Definitely, yeah, for sure. But I think there's not much else to the song, right? Mm, yeah, I'm just trying to think of anything else. It's like when it, it, it has this very like uh, like very evil sounding words. It says, it says um, what is it one two three four five? But he says it in a way where you think he's gonna fucking murder you. Mm, yeah. <laughs> You're like again stuck in this torture chamber with your yeah, eyes uh, bound and your legs, and you just wanna like, get out. Yeah. No, totally. <laughs> But yeah, that, that goes into the um, next track, which is again playing with uh, the Cold War theme, you know, uh, Over the Horizon Radar, which is a real radar. It's an anti uh, missile, I think. Yeah, it, it it it's it's like supposed to detect uh, threats. It's like a radar system somewhere. I forgot where it is, but yeah. 
Cold mm-hmm. War, Cold War vibe. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I think this is but, the most like relaxing song on the album, like on the album by far, or like interlude anyway. Over the over yeah. horizon radar. It's very calm, which is strange for the title. Calming, yeah. Maybe that means like you know if if it's if it's about a horizon radar, it's like maybe it's about like nowadays it it isn't detecting any any threats. Just mm. there's no cold war. I don't know. It's no, like, I get what so you mean. Calm. Like the the, yeah. the radar can, can chill. It can just yeah, just not do its job for a minute. Like have a yeah. have a rest. Like <laughs> okay, um, yeah. No, I yeah, I find it really like it's really like much more soothing than anything else on the album. Yeah, um, uh, it's also like it's so favorite. simple as well. Like there's not any like oh yeah, schizophrenic yeah. kind of samples and weird stuff in it. It's just like what it is, you know. But yeah. it just it I feel like it, that works so well just as like a yeah just as like a breather in that in the record as well um, yeah just within the context of the album it really works yeah it also like flows really well uh, into the next track which is my absolute favorite it's like one probably my my favorite Bolt of Canada song what about uh, your favorite song in general is it your favorite song like. Well, Dawn Chorus is just, I don't know. The first time I heard it was like when I was listening to the whole album and after being so confused by everything, you know, because you go from Beach at Red Point to something like Devil in Details and it's just so terrifying. Mm. It's Because of the time I listened to it, it just wasn't a smart idea. But when you get to Dawn Chorus and it's just so beautiful. It's, it's so, it's I don't know, it's weirdly enough, very emotional song i think yeah i, I think so it's very think... like um like cathartic yeah which is why i literally cried yeah for sure i've yeah. i've never i've never i've never cried to a song that i thought the first fucking time but this this like when i when i first listened to this it, it sealed the deal for boards of canada being my favorite artist really mm. like it's, it's 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 a really important song me i just yeah i think it just feels like a like a massive release of like ten yeah of like energy and yeah frustration yeah. and it's very like um you know i mean of course it's in the title again so i might be mentioning yeah. that but it's very like um yeah like dawn chorus like i just have those like birds and everything yeah, yeah it just feels like uh yeah like I, I i wouldn't i don't know if i would call it like the calm after a storm but like i guess it like yeah. yeah, it's just a big release of tension. I really love the drums on it. It reminds me of like trip hop. I don't know. Mm. I see, yeah, I see what you mean actually. Yeah, that's true. Like, like they're really good at, at at knowing how to use drums so appropriately. I don't know. Like, of course, an artist should know how to do that, but they do it in a way that's not cons- like not not every track has the same drums. You know, like mm. the sound. Yeah, and all the beat is it's just not the same, but it still flows incredibly well together. Yeah, for sure. I'm just, just, I just, I don't, know, I just love it so much. Yeah, no, I get that. And uh, I feel like I don't uh, pay attention enough to like the way they like program their drums. I'm not really sure. Like, I, I mean, I know you tell me that it's like all analog, and I, I, I yeah, yeah. makes sense. But like, they, they record themselves, and, or they have like drum machines sometimes. I think, but I think this was recorded by them. I'm not sure. Mm. Okay. But yeah. uh, it's it's just so raw the sound. Yeah, I've always I've always thought that it, it sounds very like it doesn't sound processed at all, like really yeah. that processed at all. It just feels like they engineered it like with actual hardware and stuff, like not just like digitally. Um, yeah, so it just sounds super raw. Um, yeah, yeah Dawn Chorus is like one of my favorite cuts in the album as well. Yeah, I think it I, had I just... a similar effect uh, when I listened to it first as well, where it's like it does feel like this release of tension and like a kind of just it comes at such a important 
point in the in the album in the track list as well. Um, so yeah. Yeah, it's like right at the end, but not really. Yeah, it, exactly. It it, it, it it will close the album pretty well, but I feel like uh, we're not gonna end it on a good note. <laughs> I think as well, like, like that would be too perfect. Like, like what you're saying with Boards of Canada, it's just like. I think actually the whole idea of like imper imperfection, like yeah. perfect and stuff, like I think I mean a lot of people, I'm sure a lot of artists like think about how they're ending their album, like you know they think about it a lot, but like yeah, you don't want to like imagine it ended on Dawn Chorus, like I think that would just be boring. Like, It'd be too perfect. Yeah, I I don't know. I think it, and 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 that just equates to boring to me. Like I just think yeah. it'd be a boring closer if it ended on Dawn Chorus. For their yeah. standards. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Exactly. Because then, I mean, if I don't mind if you want to talk about Dawn Cross more, but um, do you want to move on to Diving Station? Uh, I mean, one point yeah, go for that, it. I, that I love making is it, the the voice sounds like moaning. I think that's what most people think when they <laughs> hear it. And that's what I thought for the longest time until I found out that it's a sample of a kid in Sesame Street saying hi. Which That's is so crazy, yeah. Which is, it's bizarre. I don't know. Like, they, they, they managed to edit it to a point where it just sounds like moaning. <laughs> You're just so confused. Yeah, it sounds... I don't know why that just sounds crazy. That's so surprising to me. Because also, with their Sesame Street samples, like, I just... I feel like that was yeah. music has the right to children thing, not a GeoGaddy thing. Like, I yeah, don't yeah. Even think about, like, the kind of stuff they're sampling here doesn't feel like... I mean, maybe it's a ge- like maybe somewhat adjacent to like those kind of like old like cartoon samples and, and stuff. Yeah, like that, but, like... I think it also plays into like the idea of it's, that it's like a release. Mm, you yeah, know? It's, like, sure. it's like Sesame Street. It's a childhood thing and uh, chopped up to be something else. I don't know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Just, it's just a really beautiful song, but yeah. Yeah, it's 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 yeah, it's definitely one of my favorites as well. It just yeah, it's like a wall of just like bliss. That's what it is. Yeah, it's like yeah. it's like um, this is like what's this comparison that it sounds like love? Like a lot of interviews from that time compared it to Loveless because the wall of sound it creates, mm. and and the way it doesn't fit into its time. Yeah, I see what it's you something, mean. Yeah. Something about, like two thousand two. You don't really imagine Jugatti fitting into that time. I don't know. Like, what came out in 2002? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. Like, I feel like Giugatti, like, it's, it's, people say it all the time. And when they think something's timeless, like, it, it really, but it genuinely could have released at any point. Like, it has, yeah. it is completely time, timeless. Yeah, those, those people put an inf- emphasis on uh, my music being timeless. Like, it's not supposed to be a trend mm, uh, based yeah. on anything, it's just the sound. Yeah, for sure, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I feel like this it the way it leads onto diving station is just another example of how like that subversion of like expectation. Like diving station to me is like such a I don't know, it just feels like so hopeless and like um just feel like feeling like you're kind of trapped and, and it's like something's never gonna end to me like i feel like it's it's so so almost like equally as impactful as dawn chorus for me just because it yeah i, I don't know I, it's it's hard to describe um but yeah it's also kind of playing in with that whole concept of it feeling kind of like a like a trip you know you're just like in one place and then you're in the other yeah it's like this uh, i don't know the piano's like completely atonal like made to sound atonal like it's not mm. in tune yeah, and 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 it's like white noise in the back. I don't know. It's it's like very. I think it's it's probably the, the most uh, ominous song. Mm, I think it's the most ominous, but like I also think it's like very clearly, um, yeah, just like that sense of doom and like oh, I don't know, like just yeah, just having no hope, like whatsoever. Yeah, that's just what I thought right just now. Just yeah. Snatching that all away from from somebody, like yeah, um, definitely. It's, and it's kind of like it's just very like feels like giving up to me. 
I mean, they themselves describe it as bittersweet. I don't I know. I, I wouldn't... Yeah, exactly. Like... To me, it feels that way. I don't know. Like, like if you. I think it's. I think it's bittersweet, but I think it's to like the extreme. That's why I wasn't initially saying like wouldn't have initially thought that it's bittersweet, but like I can see it that way. Um, yeah, like yeah. I, I, I don't want to ignore Campfire Hatfield. It kind of plays into Thomas Harvest again, you know, mm. like the lack of certainty. Yeah, for sure. What well, you think that lack of certainty like kind of leads on to Campfire Headphones and stuff. Like no, uh, tomorrow's harvest, not can buy it. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, fair enough. Kind of yeah, like how that's my perception of like happy cycling, like I said. Yeah, I think can buy a face to like sum up. It's just really different. I mean, they they basically forced themselves to record acoustic. Mm, yeah. Which is why I wouldn't necessarily say it's like it has a theme. It doesn't. Yeah. Like, they did it as like a break from Giogatti, and during yeah. that time they actually recorded an acoustic version of. Uh, Music as a right to children, like yeah, they properly rec- it exists as a full acoustic version of music as a right to children. Wow, damn! Just it's it's rude to not release it. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is, I kind of I can see that. Yeah, but yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, moving on, we have um, you could fill the sky. Um, yeah, for me, I don't know why this is kind of just feels like your head's above the clouds and like. I think actually yeah. it's that, that um, kind of like, because you've got this really weird, like kind of schizophrenic, kind of gross sounding, I don't know what it's what you would call it, I guess like drum loop, but it's not a drum loop, it's just a percussion, um, or just yeah. a beat, I guess. But yeah, it's like, but then that's like really heavily contrasted against these like, like ethereal kind of like cloudy synths in the background that kind of come in. And like that flute, I think it's a flute that comes in. Um, but that oh, flute yeah. is so nice. I don't know. It's very clear. Yeah, for sure. I think this, in terms of like the nature and like the visuals, it just feels like if I could uh, describe it or sum it up in like that, in a schizophrenic way, it would be like a time lapse of like those, like I said earlier, like a time lapse of mushrooms like growing up into the sky. Yeah. But finally, I think funny thing is, this is probably the least obvious song to have anything like back masks in it. But it's, mm. it's it's definitely the song of the most, um, like clearly satanic references. Yeah, yeah. Because there's, sure. there's, 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 there's like a voice extremely black masked saying a god with horns, mm. uh, which is like from a I think Wiccan book, something I don't know. Yeah, it just has a lot of things in it that are interesting but i again i think a lot of the references they make in their songs 40 percent will probably never find yeah i agree yeah that's true that's unless it's like true. yeah yeah unless it's like a magic window silence. yeah which is not much to analyze i guess but then again you know it's a cool track but yeah i don't know why this this you could feel the sky feels like it, I guess it kind of, if you're going to, like, before talking about, like, Corsair and, like, Magic Window and stuff, like, it kind of does feel like more of a closer to the album, I guess, because it's kind of, like, the last... I mean, I guess you could some you could say Corsair is, like, the last track, but I say Corsair is, like, almost like a closer version of, um, like, Ready, Let's Go kind of thing. Yeah, but... Um, so I kind of see... I, I see Corsair as more of like a long interlude, but like you f- could feel the sky kind of as it's not as no, by no means like a conventional closer and it's not even technically really the closer, but it's the closest thing that feels like a closer on the album for me. Um, yeah, I don't know. For although, me it's like... I mean, I know, I know when I think of it though, when I think of Geogaddy, I think of Corsair and Magic Window closing it for sure. Yeah, That's why same. I think of it instantly. But like, but I mean, when I say I think of you could fill the sky as a closure. I mean that in the sense that it feels like an actual, like the last actual track on it. Kind of. Yeah, but 
like I think Kosa is like the real ending because yeah, when you I listen agree. to it, it's like this very calming, soothing noise. Yeah. It's not really like melodic. It's it's, it's just really just noise, and it and it just feels so warm. It's like l- laying somewhere uh, in the sun and just looking up in the sky and just taking it all in. Yeah, I, I agree. don't know. It's very calming. I think it feels very like, like I know you've got this whole like I kind of agree with that concept where it feels like you're walking into different rooms every like few songs or whatever, and I feel like this song, I guess Magic Window maybe like sparks the imagery as well, but like it feels like a kind of like gateway out of the album. Sort yes, of. I was gonna say that. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's like, and it, in the same way that like Ready Let's Go it feels like a kind of inviting gateway like into you, it. You're going into the building. Yeah. Like these, these, uh, this, this art installation, or whatever. Like yeah. these, these, these very real things around you, and then Kosa is like you're leaving the building and you're out in the real world and uh, taking your experience in. Mm. Like yeah. You just had. Yeah. Exactly. Totally. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. That's definitely. I, what I it. Yeah. And I really love it because of that. Mm, for sure. And then, um, yeah, it's got like a real sense of like finality to it. And then, of course, you've got like in a good Boy. way. Yeah, in a in a very yeah. good way. It's in a hopeful way. Of course, yeah, for sure. Like it, not completely hopeful, but it's like you feel like you can do something, change something. Yeah, like, yeah. Again, comparing it to Tomorrow's Harvest, which is you 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 literally end Tomorrow's Harvest on a song called "Dead Seeds." If you translate mm. it from yeah. Russian, it's like. Yeah, it's very conflicting. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So I guess moving on to the last track, which is Magic Window. <laughs> what were you going to say about it? Uh, a lot of people tried to like find something in it because they're completely insane. Mm. And they came up with nothing. Conclusion is this. I no, feel like I heard somebody tell me that it was like a really low frequency playing, but I don't obviously like that might just be a joke. Like apparently, uh, if if you try to like um something with the speed, you 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 hear a specific frequency, which is total bullshit in my opinion. Mm, yeah, <laughs> uh, I mean I think it it serves very well as like not just because of the concept of you know the six 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 within the album, but like. This is like the best use of a silent ending track that I've I've personally like heard. Uh, it really feels like actually connected to the album. Weirdly, even if it is just silent. Yeah, it's it's probably just made so throughout the album runs at sixty six minutes and six seconds. Yeah, I mean it was it was literally made for that, but like to me as well, like it also serves the function of like. You know, with Corsair, like you said, it's like oh, you've kind of just taken this all in, and it's like. Now you're hearing whatever's around you. If you're listening to Magic Wind, oh, it's yeah. intended to. I know it's, it sounds like fucking. Silly. No, 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 no. Like, it makes sense. It's like this. This is. Uh, did you know John Cale? Uh, not John. Three thirty-three. Three thirty-three. Like yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's like this completely silent piece. Okay. That's right. this video that probably I don't know. You've seen this. Like this guy goes to the piano and just doesn't play it. Yes, yeah, yeah, I've I've seen that video. Yeah, that's that's John Cage 333. His his mm-hmm. piece. It's, it's like this the sheet music. You read it and there's something on it because the yeah. purpose of it. Uh, that's what I've learned is uh, you just suppose that the music is whatever's happening around you right now in the actual world. Like that's the performance yeah. of piece. And I don't just, know. I think I think um, yeah, that's interesting. Like that's a funny thing with I think with Magic Window, it's kind of like the perfect example of how like it it's reasonable to assume that they only made it because they wanted to obviously increase the length because i think like that is the reason why they did it but like it actually equally i think it's just so cool to like think of it as that as that like you know kind of serving that purpose as well well it's like if you're going to listen to the album and then kind of like then you're visually it's i think it's just kind of like meta in a way like just kind of Maybe you're outside and you're hearing your environment or whatever during yeah, my window. 
I, I didn't think of it fast that way, but it really makes sense now what you yeah. say. It. Yeah. And I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. For they, sure. they, I mean, they they didn't make it just for where to run that specific length. I mean, they wanted to put a silent song on it, and then the owner of Warp was like, "Well, you could make it exactly that length." Hmm. So you know, it's like they intended for it, for that to be a silent song, but yeah, they sure. kind of moved it into this idea. That, so it's a joke. <laughs> mm, for sure, I think I think more than any way other way of interpreting anything on this album, I think it's my favorite way to uh, interpret two tracks, like Corsair and Magic Window, where it's like you're leaving that album and then now you're back in the real world. I guess. Yeah. I would again place into like the importance of giving of you a message, but what's not what's around us, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, remember, like, well, whatever you learned here, use it. Mm-hmm. It's very true because uh, when when you do listen to this album a lot, you do develop. I don't know. It sounds strange, but you do develop like a real closeness to nature. Mm, like I agree, you, yeah. you, like you, you understand that point when you listen to it when you're inside. It's even greater like i sometimes just uh when i'm outside i just put on my headphones and listen to his album Mm. i took yeah i totally agree i think it's a really unique way of interpreting like nature as well um because one of the artists that i kind of associate like um with taking inspiration from like environments and like their surroundings is like gas um oh yeah but like they do that completely differently it's not really like that more seems more about like the kind of like life within like nature and stuff and like it feels like more like a being heart of like a mother nature and it existing as some kind of i don't know entity or something but the way like I mean, sorry, that might be going off the mentality. No, no, no. The way with, with Boys of Canada, it feels more of as like an appreciation for nature. Yeah, it's 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 like a social commentary. Yeah. Whereas Gas is like just really, you know, hey, <laughs> nature. But yeah, exactly. Boys of Canada have a more like um, are doing social commentary in a very unique way. Yeah, like what's our relationship to nature as well? Like Yeah. That's what it makes us, you know, think about more. That's especially, I mean, that's on all of our albums, but I think it's like the most straightforward on Tomorrow's Heart. It's like really like, you, you can feel the, like, anger. I don't know, not anger, just complete lack of um, confidence in humanity. <laughs> no, I totally agree, yeah. Yeah, I feel like that makes me interpret like Tomorrow's Harvest like so much better as well because like yeah, I think if this is if this if there's any takeaway I want to give people this video is like give Tomorrow Har- Tomorrow's Harvest another chance because it is is a you know it's a great album. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know why so many people don't like it. But don't you didn't like it at first too, I think. No, or I liked it. Didn't first. To it. Or you didn't listen I, to no, it. No, it was it was uh, Campfire Hefes. Oh, right. I, like it I mean, it's not that I didn't like it. I just didn't really like. I was just. Least yeah, that's a, that's, that's that's a common opinion. Like it's it's a very split. Like the opinions on that album, mm, even they yeah. themselves knew what would happen because you know not 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 every electronic fan is into acoustic. Honestly, like it's funny, like because I was thinking about like where campfire firehead phase fits into. Like if I was thinking again about that like thing where it's like a journey of uh, like kind of coming of age journey or whatever but across their discography like i was like thinking like oh campfire head phase is the one where like you're just like randomly stoned for no reason like, <laughs> like i don't yeah, think it, oh I, my God. It, that genuinely is like the only thing i can think of it just that's brilliant yeah it's just a chill boards of canada album for the sake of for the sake of that i guess you're 20 and uh you're freshman yeah, you're like caught. I mean, I, I wouldn't say caught life for crisis, but you know. Yeah, I mean, tomorrow's harvest is you're 30 years old and you see the reality. Yes, yeah, exactly. And then the next one, I don't know, you're like dead, maybe. I don't know. Oh my god. <laughs> so you I there, hope, maybe. I hope not. There's <laughs> gonna be silence. Brilliant. Yeah.
fuck knows. Yeah. So what's the takeaway? Listen to Bolt of Canada. Um, yeah, so uh the main takeaway of this episode is that um don't discuss anybody like Gords Boards of Canada again because it will be extremely disorganized. Oh. <laughs> Um, and also to listen to Tomorrow's Harvest and also maybe to just go and listen to GeoGuardy and think about it a bit more because it's fun. Okay, so guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode as much as we enjoyed talking about Boards of Canada and maybe, I mean, I don't, can't speak for Liv, but probably going on like many tangents. So apologies. Um, uh, we hope to see you in the next episode and we're not sure if we are planning to continue the retrospective series too much as we kind of want to introduce some variety to the channel um but obviously feel free to leave some suggestions and maybe consider contributing to the to the channel and uh yeah we'll see you next time au revoir